Today's session, as you know, is a fundraising training focused on how we can identify and cultivate donors. Now, this training content is meant to be timeless. It's, it's meant to convey strategies and tools and resources that can be useful to you anytime. Uh, we will, at the end, have a specific section that talks a little bit about what this looks like during our current climate. Um, we were also, though, you'll notice, going to share some things that maybe wouldn't be quite so applicable right this moment. Um, and my thinking there is that this is stuff that you'll need to know uh, as we sort of thaw out of our full-on quarantine mode, um, and then eventually as you um, continue well beyond uh, the, the current COVID-19 moment. Um, at the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions, too, so we can talk a little further about that. So uh, we're going to start with a do now. So I'm going to drop a link into the chat. However, uh, I've also put a QR code on the top corner of the slide that you can scan with your phone if you'd like to uh, do this on your phone instead of trying to juggle different windows, especially if you're on a laptop. But uh, I'm going to have you complete a 20 question uh, quiz. It's from a guy named Tom Ahern, who's a, a great development professional. Um, some of you may have come across uh, this resource. I think I've shared it in the past, but it's from an ebook that he published that I will also share with you after today's session called 20 Questions. So you've got four minutes. My advice is uh, go with your gut. Don't, don't uh, spend too much time dwelling on this. You know, we're not going to be uh, showing you know, anybody's individual results or anything like that. Uh, don't spend time Googling to try to figure out the right answer. Just go with what you think, because a big part of the purpose is to surface some of our misconceptions. So I'll drop that link into the chat in just a second here. Just need to grab the URL. Uh, but you can get started on your phone or another device with a camera if you want to scan that QR. OK, that link is in the chat. You'll have to copy and paste it into a browser. I guess Zoom has disabled hyperlinks in the chat for security. When you are done completing your quiz, there will be a button that says view score. Uh, now, because I didn't put the right answers in, because that would be spoiling the surprise, uh, what that will take you to is a page that shows all of your responses, which if you'd like to kind of follow along, because we're going to go through some of these throughout the training today, uh, you'll be able to follow along and see how your response is compared to uh, the right answers. So go ahead and do that now. You've got uh, about four minutes. And then when our time is up, I will call us back and we will move on. And like I said, we're going to go through the, the answers to these in the course of our content this morning. OK, so I got uh, a question in the chat about your numeric score. I did not put an answer key in the back end of this quiz. So it's not going to show you what your actual score is. When you click view score, it'll show you what your answers were. And then we're going to go through those answers through the course of today's training. So if you got a zero out of 20, it does not mean that you got a zero out of 20. Uh, everyone will have gotten a zero out of 20. Um, there's no way to, to remove that feature, but I did want you to be able to um, have at the ready your answers if you wanted to look at them as we continue. Um, which is what we're going to do now. So uh, just a couple of quick notes before we uh, jump into content. Um, most of us are at this point pros at Zoom and other tools like this. We've spent uh, many, many hours uh, trial by fire on uh, learning our way around webinars and, and things like this. But uh, for anybody who somehow has avoided that, uh, just a couple of notes. Make sure that you are um, checking your audio to make sure that you've got that set up in case you need to speak. Um, uh, we like to keep folks on video during these sessions um, just as a means of people seeing kind of who's here and um, and also as a little bit of an accountability check on ourselves so that we're um, focused and, and paying attention to the content. Um, and then if you've not already done so when you arrive today, go ahead and just tell us your name, your role, and where you work. Um, today's session is going to be a little different than some of the recent sessions we've had. Um, there's much more content delivery in this session, which is um, what those of you who filled out the pre-survey kind of requested. Um, so there will be uh, some of these things won't kind of come into play quite so often. Um, the big ones is just, you know, I, I find myself when I'm on sessions like these to be constantly pulled in multiple directions as emails and texts and things pop in. Um, so my encouragement to you this morning would be um, to invest in your per personal and professional development in this, uh, in this topic. Um, and take this time and, and dedicate it and, and shut other stuff off so that you can focus and learn. 
uh, use the chat to share your perspectives on things like this. Um, go ahead and ask questions in the chat throughout our session. Um, and then just uh, as a norm, let's all be on mute with our sound unless you are speaking, in which case obviously take yourself off mute, but that just helps minimize our collective background noise and makes the experience a little better for everybody. Uh, so by way of introduction, um, for anyone who hasn't yet met me, my name is Israel DeBruin. I'm the Director of Strategy and Communication for, uh, I almost said Schools That Can Milwaukee, for City Forward Collective. I was with Schools That Can Milwaukee prior to our merger and eventual relaunch. Um, and when I first joined Schools That Can Milwaukee, which is why it was on the top of my brain, um, my role was actually communications and development. And so I got my start with the organization um, being responsible for our fundraising work. And even as my, my role switched formally to just focus on communications, I've continued to be a part of our uh, fundraising team at the organization. Um, and that's especially true now because we have been operating without a director of development um, since uh, last summer. So here's how we're gonna spend our time this morning. Uh, we already have kind of worked through our introduction um, and our do now. Uh, and like I said, we'll be revisiting the answers to those questions, or many of them anyway, uh, throughout the morning. Um, our content is gonna be divided into a few primary chunks. Four, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the essentials of fundraising strategy, which is ne necessary foundation for talking about how we can identify and cultivate donors. And then we're gonna spend about an hour talking through different aspects of how we find donors and then build and maintain those relationships with donors. Um, we'll then uh, wrap up our main content with a discussion about how this stuff fits into the current COVID-19 landscape. And then we'll end with an opportunity for questions and answers. But again, feel free to drop your questions into the chat at any time and uh, I'll answer them as appropriate or hold them until the end. And then our goal as always is to get you out of here right on time and to respect your time. So we will plan to end at or before uh, our scheduled end at 10 a.m. So what are we trying to get out of today? First, we wanna understand the principles and the best practices of donor identification and cultivation. Um, I want you to leave familiar with some of the main tools and resources that you can use to create and execute a strategy for that work. And I'm hoping we can correct some misconceptions that um, some of us might have. And that's really what that 20 questions uh, pre-quiz is, is all about. And um, as is always the case for anything City Forward Collective does, when we bring people together, we want you to be able to walk out of our space, or in this case, our virtual space, with at least one thing that you can put into practice today or tomorrow. So a couple of opening thoughts um, that, that kind of help us philosophically ground ourselves for this content. Um, a basic question, what is fundraising? Um, sometimes it's easier to think about um, questions about what something is by thinking about what it is not. Um, so we'll start there first, um, because I think a common misconception about fundraising, um, especially for people who are not in fundraising, but I think sometimes for those of us who are, is that fundraising is somehow about uh, tricking someone into doing something that they wouldn't otherwise want to do. Um, that, that it's about trying to fool someone into giving their money to you when they would have rather kept that money or spent it on something fun. Um, and that's not true, fortunately, because um, that would be a little skeezy. That's sort of used car sales tactics, huh? Um, so fundraising is connecting people with ways that they can make an impact that's aligned with their personal mission, their values, and their beliefs. Another way that you could think of this is that it's about finding people who already want to support what you do. They just don't know it yet. So because of who they are as people, because of what's important to them, um, what they value, how they wanna move through the world, they already support what you're doing. And if they only knew who you were and what you do and how you do it and why it's special, they would whip out their checkbook. And so our job as fundraisers is just to bring those two things together. And when you think about that, there's nothing skeezy about that. You're helping people do what they already want to do. Um, and it's also a little bit less overwhelming, in my opinion, because you're, it's not about trying to find people and figure out, like, how do I make the case to them? No, no, no. If there's someone out there who you have to convince or connive or fool into supporting your school, um, they aren't your people. And even if you do succeed in getting them to give you a donation once, I highly, highly suspect you'll probably only get that one donation. Okay, so diving into strategy where we'll spend just a little bit of time. Um, the first thing is just be strategic. Don't be like Mona Lisa Raffio, if uh, any of you are Parks and Rec fans. Um, her strategy for getting money is to do what she's doing in that GIF, which I hope is animated on your end, it is on mine. 
Um, but she just says, money, please, and puts her hands out. And her dad, uh, who is to her right there, our left, uh, hands it over. Um, so when you are fundraising, all of the normal rules for strategic thinking and strategic planning apply. So set some goals, make sure they're smart goals, and make sure those goals are aligned to your organization's strategic plan. So your organization's strategic plan, since most, uh, maybe even all of you today work for schools or school support organizations, probably has something to do with making sure you've got the resources to do something positive for students, right? Those are probably two key pillars in your strategic plan. You might have something else about how you want to foster your students as good citizens or um, foster a culture of generosity or something kind of uh, intangible that's related to the human development of the people you serve. But probably you've got two goals that are focused on um, serving your students and on making sure you've got the resources to do so. And obviously it's that resources part that connects directly with fundraising work. And you should not try to create a fundraising strategy and fundraising goals that are off on their own, separate from your organization's strategic plan. If your organization does not have a strategic plan, um, never fear, a lot of organizations don't have strategic plans. And if you don't think that it's reasonable to expect that your organization will create one uh, in the near term, then I think the next best thing would be to have a serious conversation with your boss um, or with your board chair or with someone else who's on your board of directors who's responsible for fundraising to understand what the specific goals around resources are and where the resources for your program come from because uh, as a school a great deal of your resources come from public sources and so you need to understand how all those pieces fit together in order to create a reasonable and meaningful fundraising goal so in other words the goal is not just go out there and raise as much money as you can you should have a specific number that's tied to specific needs in your school community um, once you've got those goals, um, and you know, I I'm, I'm trust that we all are familiar with SMART goals. If you're not, you can Google that after our session and, and uh, go down a little bit of a rabbit hole there. Um, but once you've got those goals defined, then you select the best tactics to achieve your goals. So that means you're not starting by saying, we gotta have an event, everybody has an event, let's do a big, a big dinner. Um, no, what you should be doing is saying, here are our goals. What is the very best, most effective, most efficient way to accomplish that goal? And maybe it's an event, but maybe it's not. Maybe it was an event last year or for the last 10 years, but it's not this year. And that's where we start to get into some of the, the COVID-19 implications. Um, and what I would say as a piece of advice here is use healthy skepticism when you're evaluating uh, tactics because um, folks in our organizations, especially folks, very well-meaning folks on our board or key donors, um, might suggest a tactic that they're very excited about. Maybe they saw another organization doing it, and so they feel some pressure for the organization that they are a part of to do it too. Um, again, those aren't good reasons to do something. If they are not the best way that you can achieve your fundraising goals and the most effective way that they can achieve your fundraising goals, um, then they're probably not something that's worth your time and your resources on the front end, unless they're helping to achieve a secondary goal. Okay, use data to support your goals. So. Uh, when you're creating these goals, don't just say, well, we want 100% of last year's donors to give again this year. Um, I have no idea if that's realistic for you uh, because I would need to look at how many donors renewed from two years ago to last year, and maybe even you know, looking back further than that to figure out what, what are you doing on average? Is it 70% of your donors renew each year? Is it 80%? Um, once you figure out how many of these, uh, these past donors typically renew, you can start to set a SMART goal for how many you're gonna try to, to renew again this year. Um, so same thing for lapsed donors. If there's donors who used to give uh, in the past and then last year they didn't, and you wanna try to re-engage them, um, set a goal around how many of those lapsed donors you're gonna bring back. How many of your ongoing donors are you gonna upgrade? How many of them do you want to give a larger size of your gift? So again, use data from your past performance to make sure that your, your uh, goals are staying realistic, grounded in reality, achievable, and meaningful. So if 70% of your 2018 donors gave again in 2019, maybe you're gonna say, okay, we wanna up that because in, before this year, we weren't really trying to get uh, those folks to renew. Um, we just happened to get 70%. So maybe if we put some concerted effort on this, we can up this to 80%. Um, another thing after you've got your, your goals clear, make sure you, are very, very clear on your case for support. This is also called a message platform or a manifesto, or maybe it's a boilerplate grant proposal. Basically, it's a one, one place that contains a very concise or relatively at least clear and, and agreed upon set of messages. So all of your key messagers 
your, your executive director, your board chair, the chair of your development committee, they're all on the same page about this language. Um, this will save you tons of time later because when you're writing an appeal letter, you can just keep going back to this library of language and pulling from there instead of feeling like you have to come up with brand new novel ways to explain everything about your program every time you write. So key ingredients, all of the, the sort of journalistic uh, Ws, who, what, uh, how, why, uh, who you serve, um, if you want to add some other things, or if you want to think a little deeper about this, um, answer questions like what sets you apart from other people doing similar work for schools. This is especially important because there are lots of schools out there and they're all trying to raise money from the same uh, pool of people. So uh, it's important that you, you draw some distinctions. Make clear what problem you're addressing and who you're addressing it to. Um, and I'm not going to read through this slide here, but you can get an idea of uh, what kinds of things you want that uh, case for support to cover. Um, for our organization, the, the product that, that we've made that fits this purpose, we've called our conversation guide. And some of you have seen that before, um, but just to, to connect the dots here. Another idea uh, for, for um, how you can get strategic, there's a handful of tools that I recommend you at least consider. And as I, I usually advise in our trainings, don't leave here thinking you gotta put all of this into place all at once. Pick a small number, okay? So I'm not showing you these things to say, this is what everyone who is worth their salt in fundraising is already doing, and if you're not, you're behind. I'm saying here are some things that are really worth considering. Maybe pick one if you're not doing these things to step up your game. So one is creating a donor continuum to track progress. So basically you are um, creating names and definitions for the stages that you're trying to move your donors through as they go from brand new to folks who support you. So here's an example that I made a few years ago for schools that came Milwaukee. So it's a, a little bit out of date, but it was the um, best kind of complete snapshot I could show you. Um, and if, if this is something that you'd like to, to have uh, later, I can definitely send it out uh, via email. But this is just a screen grab, but you'll see here that we've named these stages. Um, we've defined them with that, that second row characteristics. And then we've also assigned some specific actions that we plan to apply for people who are in each of those phases. This is not rocket science. If you're looking at it, it's, it's a little bit like, oh yeah, this is, this is fairly obvious, but there's some power in codifying it in creating a shared vernacular for the folks on your team and in your leadership so that you can have a conversation about, you know, right now, so-and-so is really in our pursue category and we want to move them this year into convince. That's our goal. And here's our plan to do it. So you can get a little more strategic in your conversations, a little more intentional in your conversations. Um, so again, you're uh, connecting specific concrete actions that you are going to do for any donor that's in those stages, which again gives you a, almost like a checklist. Um, you can build this right into however you track your donations and your progress. So if you have a CRM you use like DonorSnap or Razor's Edge or Salesforce, um, there are ways that you can build this continuum right in there. It might come with a built-in continuum already in there that you may or may not be using. Um, and then, like I said, you can set specific actionable goals around how you're going to move people along this continuum. Uh, another idea, um, this is a, a fairly common one, but you can create a gift chart to break down your goals. So you'll notice here on the left-hand column, we've got a list of gift sizes. Uh, the next column over, we have the number of gifts that we want to receive of each size. And you'll notice that the largest gift is the smallest. On the next page, we'll show you another example here um, that, that for some of you who are more spatial thinkers will help you visualize this a little bit better. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of like the food pyramid concept where the, the, the um, gift that you are expecting the greatest number of that, that forms the, the base of your support um, is the smallest amount. Um, but you'll also notice another thing about this, that you've got uh, two to four times as many prospects for every gift of that size you hope to receive. So again, this is a good way to, to conservatively plan and to make sure that you are um, designing a pipeline that is going to get you where you need to go. Again, make sure that you're looking into past performance in order to make a realistic plan. So if last year you only landed one gift that was at or above the 10K level, um, you probably should not build a gift chart that plans to get five gifts at, at or above the 10K level. Maybe if you got one last year, you go for two this year, three. Um, and if you take your goals that were based on your organization's strategic plan or those conversations with your boss and you're building down into this gift chart, but you can't make the math work, that when you break it up into a gift chart like this, you're saying, okay, we've got our total fundraising amount. We need to scope it out here so that we know where the money is going to come from. And if the math isn't working, if you can't get realistically up to the number of your overall goal, then something needs to change. 
either your goal is unrealistic or you need to uh, make some pretty significant changes to how you're approaching your fundraising tactics. So uh, another piece of advice, the highest gift on that chart should be about 10 to 20% of your goal. Okay, so that the gift chart sort of scales with your overall fundraising goal load. Once you've got that gift chart, you can create what's called a weighted pipeline. This is a, a technique borrowed from sales. Some people love weighted pipelines. Some people hate weighted pipelines. The idea here is to slot all of your prospects in. If you've got many prospects, this can take a long time. Um, and you're using your prior data combined with new information you've got from your work and maybe from board members or other people giving you inputs. And you're doing an estimate of the likelihood of the gift. So I've, I've put in some names of our team here. So uh, we'll say that, that uh, Patricia Hoban, our executive director, is, is maybe good for 10 grand. Probably not. I, I have no idea. This is just uh, totally hypothetical. But um, we'll say we're pretty sure she's going to give. She's, she's a big fan of the mission. Um, and so we're going to say she's, uh, she's probably 80% likelihood. Now, Israel DeBruin, on the other hand, is totally stingy. He's a jerk. Uh, we think maybe we can get 100 bucks out of that guy, but really it's, it's a 1 in 10. Um, and you'll, now you'll notice on the right-hand column, uh, we're mathing out the ask with the probability to forecast the amount we bring in which seems a little silly, right? Because with uh, Patricia, if we're saying there's an 80% probability that she brings in $10,000, how does that equal $8,000? That's ridiculous because she's either gonna give or she's not, or maybe she's gonna give a smaller amount. Um, this is an estimate, it's a projection. But what this allows you to do is to start gaming out, um, again, on the probabilities, what you might bring in through all these asks. Because maybe Israel De Bruyne at 10% probability is actually gonna give you zero but Patricia is gonna give you that $10,000. And so uh, when you build a large enough chart here, the, the margin of error shrinks and it winds up being an, a fairly reliable forecast. Again, this is stuff that you can build right into tools you already use. You can do this simply in an Excel spreadsheet with some formulas. Uh, your CRM might have this functionality built in or might uh, be something that you can easily add. You can um, find templates online. Most of the templates online are, are for sales applications versus fundraising. Um, and once you've got this in place, you can use this as your fundraising tracker as you go. So you can tweak your probabilities based on new information you get. So if you find out that someone you had at 90% just lost their job, maybe you lower it to 10%. Um, if somebody gives you the gift, you can bump their probability up to 100%. So now in your projection, they count for the full weight of that gift. And likewise, uh, when Israel DeBruin stiffs you on that $100 gift, you can uh, bump it down to $0 so that it's no longer weighted in that projection. Okay, done with part one, strategy. Next, how do we find these people? Um, if you joined us for our marketing training a couple of months ago that was mainly focused on student enrollment, there are some very similar principles that apply here, which is the best way to find more people who support your mission is to find more people who are very like the people who already support your mission. Um, we'll go over a little bit of that further. We're not going to go nearly as in-depth with that marketing uh, as we did with the marketing training because we got a lot of other ground to cover, but I wanted to make that connection for those of you who are a part of that session. So the first thing to start with is finding people who are close into your organization and people who are like those folks close in. And then maybe um, once you feel like you've really got that locked down, you can expand to pursue other types of people. Um, the logic here is if you've already resonated with a certain type of person, it's very likely to think that you'll resonate with other people who are like those people. So if your organization is faith-based, for example, it's very likely that your, your work will resonate with other faith-based people. And it's possible that you could change your messaging a little bit, downplay your faith-based uh, uh, background, or, or maybe make it non-denominational if you're, if you're like a strong Catholic organization and you're like, okay, we're, we still want to be faith-based, but we're going to like get rid of all the like Catholic specific language and, and signifiers and try to pursue people who care about faith-based education, but maybe aren't Catholic. Okay, that might be a good idea. Maybe you'll be able to broaden your base, but the risk there is you could alienate or remove value from the people that you've already got who are really invested in your organization. So proceed with caution when you're trying to widen your base because you could wind up watering down exactly what your sort of super, uh, your, your super donors find valuable and interesting and aligned about who you are and what you do. 
Um, so think of donors in concentric circles and work outward from the center. So the people at the closest core of your organization um, in your donor landscape are your board members. So make sure that you're focusing on them first. Sometimes we take them for granted because we almost think of them in a way as like, you know, quasi employees. Oh, of course they have to give their board members. They don't. Uh, and also, um, maybe they're not giving at their full capacity. Maybe they're on a bunch of boards and, and yours is one that they're like sort of half invested in. Um, so there's, there's definitely, uh, it's definitely a good idea to focus on renewing and upgrading gifts from your board members. Um, also focus on your current donors. Don't ignore the people who are already giving you, um, giving to you. Focus next on your lapsed donors, going back to the people who gave last year, but not this year, and then going back to the folks who gave two years ago, but not last year. Because again, those are folks who already showed you proof that they are invested and aligned with your mission. And so it's, it's, a, it's less of a lift to uh, convert them anew versus finding a brand new person who has no relationship with your organization. Um, I'll go a little deeper here because uh, there's some estimates that show for every dollar that you spend acquiring a new donor, you only get 50 cents back on their first gift, which means that you can't, if, if that math is true for you, and, and again, this is sort of a broad nonprofit industry average, but if that math holds for you, that means you can't break even, so to speak, on a new donor unless they renew at least once. And here's the, the real kicker, 80% of people who give never give again. Um, and most of them only intended to give once. So it's not impossible to renew them, but the default state of a donor is that they're not coming back. So once you've got your, your, the folks you've already got a relationship with and you want to move beyond that, which is I think what a lot of us um, wanted to, to most get out of this is, okay, okay, but how do I find the new people? Um, start again with the folks you've already got a strong relationship with. So um, you could talk with your board chair and your executive director about establishing what's called a give get requirement for your board. This is where people who join your board or who, who choose to stay on your board after the give get is implemented say that they agree each year that they are going to give or bring in from others a, co a combined total of X number of dollars. So for some board members who really strongly personally believe in your mission, um, if the give get is $10,000, maybe they're like, you know what, I'm just going to write that $10,000 check for someone else who is less well off or who their, their way of giving to your organization is to bring lots of others in, they're, saying, they're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna give $1,000, but then I'm gonna find nine other people to also give $1,000, people from my personal and work circles. Uh, another tactic that I've uh, recently seen gaining steam is to sell uh, packets or, or packages for events in multiples. So um, even to the extreme of not selling single tickets for events, only selling tickets in pairs of twos or fours. The idea being that your donors have to bring someone else, or if they're a couple, they have to bring another couple, um, or they're sort of just like donating the value of that extra ticket. There are all kinds of logistical ways that this can go sideways if you think that you're, you know, getting twice as many attendees because you've sold, you know, all of these two pack tickets and a bunch of people are like, ah, I'll just plan to go by myself and, you know, I'll eat the cost of the extra ticket and then you've got all this wasted food. So be thoughtful about this. It's just one thing that you can think about doing. Um, another one that is proven to work, the research says this works, is uh, some sort of incentive. So either creating a contest, um, say that we've got this, you know, this iPad that we're gonna give away to a, a new donor this year or during this campaign. Um, so every new donor will be entered into this drawing and one person is gonna get this iPad. Um, that's uh, proven effective. Another one that's proven effective is uh, matching or challenge grants. Um, the thing here is that they're diminishing returns with the additional matches that you, you add on. So a one-to-one -one match where for every new donor dollar, this, this existing donor is gonna give a dollar also, so you double your impact, that's very powerful. When you say for every dollar you give, this person's gonna give two, it's actually, it, it, it's still a little bit better than one-to-one, -one, but you don't get like twice the impact. And then if you go up to three to one, you really barely see a boost at all. So uh, the best way to get the most mileage for those matching grants is really just to stick with the one-to-one -one or maybe the two-to-one. 
find folks who are your super donors and especially your cheerleaders, the people who are always sharing your stuff on social media, who are forwarding your emails to friends. Um, these are folks that you could leverage to help bring in even more additional donors. Tap these people. They have shown you through their behavior and their words that they want to be more involved. So get them engaged in helping to plan something, get them on a committee on your board, ask them if they want to host a cocktail reception in their home or at a restaurant they like. Um, and you know, they can, they can pick up the bill for the, the catering and then you can help out with all of the events and the planning and the logistics. And you can get a room full of 20 of their closest friends. They can give some remarks about why they care about your organization. Um, you or your boss can give some remarks about what you do as a school and you've brought in a whole bunch of brand new people to your mission. And when, in our COVID section, we'll talk about how that particular tactic can be adapted to our, our new virtual norms. Um, watch for signals from people who have not yet given you money. So if you've got folks on your list um, and, and they're not you know, other nonprofit colleagues because we all read one another's newsletters to see what kinds of cool stuff you're doing that we should also try doing. Um, but for people who are not nonprofit professionals but who are on your list and who you notice when you look through your data on your, your email blast tool, they're, they're regularly opening stuff and clicking on stuff. They're, they've maybe come to some events but they've never donated. Um, they're engaging with stuff you're putting out into the world. Those are folks who have shown you with their behavior that they're interested in what you're doing. And it, all it might take is for you to call them up, introduce yourself, have a conversation, maybe do that a couple of times. Um, and then the next time they get an ask, they're gonna give. Um, and then again, like I said at the beginning of this section, the best way to find um, more donors is to look for more people who are similar to those who you already have. So figure out who are the people that you already have. Um, focus specifically on your super donors. So the people who have been giving to you for the longest number of years, who give the largest quantity of money, um, or who give maybe every month or, or multiple times a year. These are the folks that have really shown a strong investment in your mission. See if you can figure out when you pull a report or just start assembling a list based on conversations with your boss or your board, um, what is similar about these people? What do they have in common? Is there some sort of shared affinity um, are they all part of the same church congregation or social club? Um, do they all have a consistent um, political leaning? Do they all also give to some other organization? Once you can start to identify some patterns, those are things that you can put into action to target more people who are like them that are not yet in your circle. And take a look at how you've gotten those current donors because that tactic is likely to be successful again. So if you got a lot of really great donors who are still with you from some um, some brown bag lunch that you had at Quarles and Brady. Maybe it's time to think about doing another brown bag lunch at Quarles and Brady or at some other downtown law firm. Okay, so uh, at the top, you took this quiz uh, from Tom Ahern from his ebook called 20 Questions, which is one of the best single fundraising resources I have ever encountered. And it's kind of difficult to find on the internet for some reason, and I don't think you can buy it. So I will send it to all of you after this. Um, it's about, I have my paper copy that I, I fortunately had the foresight to grab from the office before we all abandoned our posts. It's about uh, 55 pages long, um, and it is totally worth your time. And you should probably make your boss read it also. Um, so when you're building a profile for donors, you might ask yourself, how old is the typical donor? Um, let me see if I can quickly figure out uh, what we said as a group. Okay, I'm gonna, while this is loading, keep talking through here. So how old is the typical donor? You might think that they are a lot younger than they actually are because the average donor is 75. Uh, a quote unquote young donor in uh, the United States would be about 60. And that's because um, charitable giving is very linked to life stage. So at about 55, um, folks start to own their homes, they start to pay off their debts, maybe their kids move out. And suddenly, even if they aren't wealthy people, um, they start to find themselves with some, uh, some expendable income, and they start to feel a little more grateful for what they've got. Uh, okay, so looking at our results, uh, it looks like one of you got this one correct. Uh, most of us said uh, 55 was the average age. So here's a graph that breaks down. Uh, this is from Blackbaud, uh, but also in embedded in this 20 questions book. Um, it's a little tough to see, but this is your under 35 sliver, the 4%. 
um, which means that people under 45 make up fewer than 15% of donors and almost 75% of the pie are folks 55 and older with almost half of them being uh, above 65. So that makes you wonder, um, and I'm sure some of us have often been told, um, as is evidenced by our results, where 100% of us said, yes, younger donors are important to our charity's future. But the answer is actually no. Uh, there's a joke here. How do you raise money from a millennial? You wait till they turn 45. Because it's not about being young, it's about moving through those life stages. So if you're focusing on people who are young now, thinking, oh, we've got we've to cultivate them and they'll give us 100 bucks now and then maybe they'll give us $10,000 when they're more established. Um, there's not actually um, a lot of evidence to support that strategy. Uh, you are better off waiting until those folks are older and then pursuing them. And here's another thing too is there's, uh, I know on our board, since I joined the organization um, like seven years ago, there was a lot of conversation about like, how do we engage millennials? And as who for a, a little bit of time early on when I was there was the, the token millennial at the organization, um, a lot of those questions were directed toward me. Um, but here's the thing, right now, the baby boomer generation controls about 80% of personal wealth in the US. Um, and that means that they're going to continue making up the, the vast majority of fundraising prospects for at least the next three decades because the oldest baby boomers have just gotten to that 75 year old number. Okay? The youngest are in their early 60s. And so that means about for the next 30 years or so, the baby boomer generation is going to continue to be the main target for fundraising in the United States. So be thoughtful about that and be thoughtful about what that means for your tactics. We'll talk a little more about that later. So we got some questions in the pre-survey about alumni. Um, now, you might think based on what we just learned from uh, the 20 questions book that alumni are a totally lost cause. And I do think it's worth considering what we just talked about in the last two slides when you're thinking about alumni. Um, you could also though think of alumni as your one long-term prospect investment that actually could make sense because you've got a very strong relationship with them, different from how you might go out and try and get random young donors, um, which the, the 20 questions book talks about how the the one tactic that is proven to be successful with young donors is um, the, I'm sure you've experienced this, where fundraisers out on the street accost you. Um, in, in the UK, I guess they call this chugging, short for charity mugging. Um, that's the one thing that has proven to be successful for young donors, but um, those young donors are not very sticky. They give that one time when they got accosted on the street and then they don't really give again, or they give because their friend is doing a, a fun run or something like that, and then they, they don't give again to that charity. Um, so for alumni, because most of them in the near term are gonna be really young and not well positioned to provide much financial support, I would advise you to focus on building the relationship, focus on their emotional connection to your institution and on experiences you can help them have that reconnect them with that emotional experience. Um, but you got to really look hard at how much you are spending on your alumni and how much you expect to get back. So look at, for your average donor, just take your whole database and figure out what do we get on average for a year from our average donor, and maybe it's $500. And then think about how much you are spending on your alumni engagement strategy per person um, and figure out okay, how long do we think we could get, get funding from an alumni at that $500 rate? You can start to game out a very rough estimate of how much you will spend over the lifetime of an alumni trying to engage them versus how much you'll get in return in your fundraising. Now, fundraising is not the only reason to engage your alumni. There are lots of other, other great reasons that might be aligned with your organization's strategic plan. Maybe you provide support to alumni who are in college. Maybe you have a multi-generational mission where you're connecting alumni with current students. Nativity Jesuit in Milwaukee is a great example of that. So I'm not saying um, you're like never do alumni and you're dumb if you do and it's a waste of money. I'm just saying if you're putting a lot of your eggs in that basket, hoping to get a big return on that investment one day, you might be disappointed or you might find that the, the amount that you spent on doing mailers and events and um, personal phone calls and care packages and things like that, um, that, that you don't come anywhere close to getting that back in the long run. Um, okay, so when it comes to totally cold outreach, so meaning a person that you've got no relationship at all with, no connection with, they've never been to anything, you just like heard of them once. How, how do you find these people and how do you solicit them? So 
Um, first, as many of us have probably done, you can scour any public facing donation list that you can find. Um, so look on websites, look on annual reports, look on 990s, um, try to find from your peer organizations, any of those names. Um, there are a lot of folks who put that stuff in public places, some folks who don't, um, but you can definitely find some and you can start to watch for patterns. So you can find people who pop up on multiple lists and you can start to figure out, oh, I see this person shows up um, in a lot of charter schools. So maybe they have a motivation around the specific model of charter schools, or you find that they've got a, a, a pattern of giving to Lutheran schools and you can you know, surmise that they probably are invested in something having to do with the Lutheran faith identity. And so if you also are a Lutheran school, maybe they'd be a good prospect. You can also deselect people that way too, because if you're not a Lutheran school and you see that this individual really only gives to Lutheran schools, then probably don't waste your time. Um, and then once you've started to build a list of these folks, take them to your team, take them to your board and say, does anybody know this person or do you know anybody who knows them? And you will be surprised because Milwaukee is a small place with lots of social interconnections. You will be surprised how many times someone goes, oh yeah, I do know that person. I, can, I could ask them to come to an event or I could bring you to lunch with them. Um, if you don't have any of those connections, uh, LinkedIn is a decent tool where you can start to see who might be professionally connected. Um, it's not a perfect tool, of course, because some of us just, uh, you know, accept any LinkedIn invitation that comes our way. I know I do that. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that I actually know that person professionally. Um, and then you can start to scheme ways that you might get in front of that person. So um, if you see that they, um, that they, I don't know, are a member of the university club, for example, and you know, one of your board members is a member of the university club. Um, but this board member doesn't happen to know this person. Um, you might say to this board member, hey, watch for this person at the U Club and see if you can strike up a conversation. Um, you can start to just come up with like little plans like that for how you might make a connection with this person. Okay, now here's another trick that I've shared with some of you um, and I'll send more detailed instructions in an example of this later. But um, another way to go about totally cold outreach specifically for um, small family foundations, the kinds that don't have websites, you'll never see them, you know, there, there's not really a way to apply to them. These are the kind of family foundations that are, they don't have a staff, there's just some lawyer at Corals who handles all the paperwork and they get together by phone once a year to decide who's going to get the gifts and mostly it's the same organizations every year. There's a way to tap into these. So, uh, I, I, and a little bit of background on this, when I first, first started at schools that came Milwaukee, they sent me to this grant writing workshop for two days at Marquette University, and it was super useless. Um, I, I learned very little. I did learn this though, and that was worth the price of admission um, all by itself, because we've raised uh, several thousand dollars on this strategy, paid for that course, and then some. Uh, so start by searching on guidestar.org or some similar tool that lets you search for nonprofit organizations by zip code. That's a way that we usually don't use GuideStar. Um, why zip code? Well, because it's going to turn out any nonprofit that has its legal address in that zip code. Now, you can do this in any zip code. Um, I would advise you to specifically focus on the 53212 and any other zip codes that are in or immediately around downtown because that's where a lot of these large law firms are located. And as I mentioned uh, in my lead up to this, a lot of these small family foundations um, their physical address is at these law firms. So you'll see a ton of these foundations that are, that are allegedly housed at 111 Wisconsin, which is you know, the US Bank building, um, or the, the 411 building where Quarles is. Um, because these, these really just exist on paper. They're a bank account, right? They don't have an office, they don't have a staff. So once you've got this list, you can start looking at 990s and scanning through past giving. This is a great thing to give to um, one of your reports, to an intern, or something to do on a rainy day when you got a bunch of time to burn. Um, scan those 990s and look for those patterns. Is there a lot of giving that aligns with your school? And then you send a very simple letter. You're not asking for money. You're asking for a lunch meeting. Now, you maybe need to adapt that during this time, but there, there's uh, one detail that uh, makes me think, maybe not, um, but you send a letter, asking for a lunch meeting. There's a very brief explanation of who you are and what you do, but basically you're saying, hey, I recently became aware of the activities of such and such a foundation, and I'm really interested in hearing more about your work. I think it aligns a lot with the work that I'm doing at such and such an organization, and you give a couple sentences of, of what you do. I was wondering if we could grab lunch sometime and talk further about this to see if there's, there's you know, any ways that we can collaborate. 
So super soft ask, you're asking for lunch, people love lunch. Um, and then you're probably not gonna hear anything back. So you call to follow up. And a lot of times you can find on that 990, the phone number of whoever, whether it's um, listed as the board chair, which is you know a member of the family that the foundation was created by, or maybe it's the lawyer, but you're, you're calling to follow up. Um, I'd suggest call and follow up three times before you call it quits, maybe a, spaced a week or two apart. Um, and what ends up happening with this is one of a few things. Either they are going to just send you a check. Um, I'm not joking. We've had that happen multiple times where like we never interacted with these folks besides this first letter that I sent and we got a check back. Um, sometimes they will reply with a brief application form um, or, or just like some questions that you can fill out to apply for the organization. We've also gotten several thousand dollars through that. Sometimes they'll, they'll call you back um, or you'll get them on the phone and they'll ask you some questions. Um, sometimes they're very perplexed or even upset that you've called them. So there is that outcome. Um, I know Mike Wynn, who's, who's now at Carmen, when he was at Stellar, he tried out this strategy based on my advice. And the person who he called was really um, unhappy that he had called. And she apparently did not realize that her phone number was listed on the 990 and was totally skeezed out by the fact that um, this random person called her cell phone number. But uh, usually people are cordial. They're Midwest nice at minimum about this. Um, and it gets you, it gets your foot in the door. Um, and like I said, a lot of times you hear nothing back, but sometimes you get a check. And because of the nature of these foundations, a lot of times once you're on their list, you're on their list and you're getting a check every year. Okay, so there's a little bit of, uh, fundraising in general is, is a combination of art and science. Um, and so there's a quasi scientific way that you can start to assess donors, especially donors that you don't know much about to understand if they should be prospects. And uh, this I borrowed from, um, from a fundraiser whose name is gonna appear on the bottom of the slide in a moment, um, which I, I should have mentioned earlier, I've got some italicized uh, references on the bottom of some of these slides, just to give a nod to the folks that I pulled this, this info from. So not all of this is uh, coming as a Israel DeBruyne original. Um, so the ABCs of assessing donors. First, access. Do you have any connection to this person? Do you even have their contact info? Um, do you have a way that you can get a, a, get a hold of them? Um, B, belief. Do you have reason to guess that they actually care about you and your mission? So a pattern of giving, um, some sort of uh, signal of their affiliation, or some intel from someone close to your organization. And then C is capacity. Um, do you think that they actually have the money to make a gift of the size that you are seeking. So someone is not a great donor prospect just because they are around your organization a lot. Like I said, um, I read all of your newsletters. I do give to, to several of your organizations, but that doesn't mean that because I have a pattern of giving and have shown evidence of reading a lot of your stuff that you can come hit me up for you know a $50,000 grant because I ain't got it. Um, and so you've got to have a means of assessing that. Um, that's a little tricky, but we'll talk a little bit more about ways you can do that. So let's go deeper on the belief. Um, like I said, you can look at how often they show up to your stuff, if they've volunteered at your school, um, if they've got a history of giving elsewhere, uh, you can um, watch for how they interact with the stuff that you put out into the world. Um, capacity is the trickiest one. Um, you can look at just the sort of like the hard and fast stuff, like what zip code do they live in? Um, probably if they have a third ward condo, and especially if they have a third ward condo and a house out in Lake Country, you can probably make some assumptions about how much money they have. If they've got a senior level job title at a prestigious firm, like they are the CEO, for example, or a senior director or vice president, um, or if they on their LinkedIn or profile have some sort of degree that, prop, that, that oftentimes lines up with a higher salary. Um, and you can look for uh, examples in other organizations, 990s, um, or other public evidence of them um, giving uh, a certain amounts or, or to certain causes. There are resources for this. So for very wealthy people, um, uh, the, the website and magazine Forbes maintains a database of uh, high net worth individuals. Um, a lot of it is like a, a patchwork. So, so you gotta take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, most of these folks don't want people to know exactly how much money they have. Um, and so the Forbes stuff is a little bit guesswork. Sometimes people's net worth on Forbes profiles are overinflated. Sometimes they're underestimated, um, but you can get a, a decent, concise uh, look at who they are, where their money comes from, and how much they might have. There's also um, a tool called Wealth Screening from Donor Search. Uh, this is pretty expensive, but it is uh, something that combs 
um, public records for property and investments and things like that and combines it into a searchable database. Um, like I said, it's expensive. It's usually used by blue chip large charities. It's probably not something that you could successfully make a case to your boss or board to spend money on, um, but it does exist. Um, and if at any point you've got like access to it through a professional connection, by all means, go for it. Um, and then once you've kind of assessed someone on these ABCs, you can start to, like I said, quasi-scientific, but you can start to, to score them on both of these, uh, these axes um, to identify who would be a strong prospect. So you can score them on affinity. You can come up with some internal definitions for what someone needs to do or be in order to score a five on affinity, meaning they really believe in your cause. Um, they, they really uh, show that they, they are invested. And then capacity, obviously, is how much you expect that they can give. And you can plot them out on this, um, this quadrant and figure out who would be strongest. So obviously, the people who are the most worth your time and investment are the folks Sorry, I just got a weird notification from Zoom. Um, hopefully we don't run into any problems here. Thumbs up if you can still hear me and see the slides and stuff. Okay, cool. So we will keep going and hopefully uh, we don't get, our, uh, get ourselves interrupted. Um, so anyway, you can score your folks on these two axes and then uh, assess where they fall relative to one another, which will help prioritize um, who is worth your, your time investment and your, your financial investment. Okay, moving on to our next chunk here. So once you've identified these folks, you've found them, um, how do you engage and cultivate them? How do you build a relationship? So like most good things in life, and, and I think you all know this, this kind of intuitively because you work in schools, um, so much requires relationship for success. So teaching is certainly true. Okay, you need to have a relationship to make solid progress uh, as a teacher. The same is true for fundraising. Um, relationship either with an individual or with an organization. Um, so since that's so essential, uh, let's go back to our 20 questions again. How many charities will a typical donor support in a year? I'm finding our group answer here. Um, we said fewer than five was our guess as a group for most of us. It's actually the, the other choice, five or more. Um, but that, that's, that cuts both ways. So that's good news because you're thinking, oh, I, that, that's great. People are more generous than I thought. It also means that there's a lot of competition out there. Um, and the number of U.S. charities over the last 20 years has roughly doubled. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of competition and the competition is growing. Now, how long will you hope to maintain a donor? We said, as a group, we had kind of mixed responses here. Um, most of us felt like it was about one to three years. Um, it is about six years, maybe less. Now, this, uh, the, the data is a little mixed here because I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of one-time donors, folks who give and then never come back. Um, and so that pulls this average down. But then on the other side, you've got folks who give for their whole lifetime. So you've got the, the tail ends of the bell curve, um, but the, your, your heart of the bell curve is about six years. Um, and like I said, there, there's a lot of donors who give just one time. So how do you make sure that you aren't just churning through these first time donors that you're spending $2 for every $1 you're getting back from them? Um, you've got to enact a, a, a systematic way of engaging and building relationships with and appreciating your donors. So, um, this is not hard and it actually doesn't even take very much time but it's a little bit of an overwhelming prospect so a lot of us um, keep shoving it to the back burner it never feels urgent um, so i'm going to encourage you to, to take one small action after today to start building this into your practice and i've got some concrete suggestions for that uh, coming up on a later slide so um, this is connecting with folks without an ask you're not asking them for money you're just connecting you can do this through mailed notes you can make a phone call. You can have special events that, are, that don't have an ask that are just a small um, reception for donors. UCC does this really, really well. Um, and a lot of times they invite nonprofit partners to their donor appreciation events. You can go uh, take a look at one in person. Um, of course, when they start having them again. Uh, 
you can also give special access to your org leadership. Um, you can send small gifts, uh, like, a, like something that one of your students made or, uh, or a piece of swag that has your logo on it. Um, really, your goal is just to help them feel that, that warm glow altruism of connected with their philanthropic gift. You're trying to kind of renew that emotional benefit that they get from giving to your organization. Um, it also gets you a little bit of a conversational foot in the door to give an individualized update on what you're doing or answer the questions that they might have. So you call up just to say, hey, um, I just wanted to, to reach out and let you know we really appreciate your ongoing support. Um, you know, a lot of cool things have been happening. Here are a couple of examples. I wanted to know if you have any other questions. Um, keep track of this stuff. You can be fancy and have it built into your CRM or you can just be brass tacks and build it into a, a spreadsheet. Um, but keep track of who you've talked to and when, and if you wanna go a little bit further, um, what was the, the tone and temperature of that conversation? Was it warm? Um, were they really engaged? Did they not initially remember who you were and who your organization was? Those are all things that are valuable to know. Um, you can, if you've got the, the CRM set up for this and you've been tracking, this allows you to create reports or dashboards that show you who has been the longest without a personal reach out, who has been the longest that hasn't gotten a phone call or hasn't attended an event. And then you can use that to prioritize who you're calling or who you're inviting to stuff. Um, here's one from, uh, from one of our colleagues, uh, Karen Hunt, who's not on today's uh, training, but was here for our um, fundraising uh, check-in last week. Um, she's got a strategy she calls her 10 by 10, um, which is she makes 10 phone calls uh, to donors by 10 a.m. each day. Now, this sounds like, oh, that's great if you've got that hour plus, but um, Karen said it actually does not take anywhere close to an hour, and that's because a lot of folks aren't gonna answer. You're gonna leave them a message. You're gonna talk to maybe two or three of them, and the conversations are gonna go maybe three to five minutes. But this is a way to go very bite size. If you can't do 10, make it five, make it one. Anything is gonna be better if you're doing nothing right now. You can also take a portfolio approach. This is what larger organizations do. Um, we had uh, one of the members of the Boys and Girls Club development team on our fundraising uh, check-in last week. Um, they have obviously a much larger, more institutional giving approach. And so they've got a portfolio where donors are divided up among their staff um, to maintain these personal relationships. You don't need to be a large team to do that. You can, it can be just you and your boss that each have a small portfolio. But this lightens the load. Um, it gives you opportunities to strategize so that if there's um, someone who uh, has some sort of something in common or an affinity with someone on your staff team, you can put this person in, in that, their portfolio, um, which will just give more um, fodder for conversation. We'll, we'll just uh, create a stronger opportunity for relationship. Um, and then this also future proofs you against what happens to a lot of nonprofits where if you've got this really charismatic longtime um, leader or founder who owns all of the fundraising relationships, well, what happens when that person leaves? It's a problem. And so uh, pivoting to a portfolio approach, even gradually over time and diversifying who's got those relationships uh, is going to set you up for success in the long term so that if your founder or your charismatic leader departs, um, you don't wind up in a situation where people wanted to give to that person and not necessarily your organization. Um, you can also create giving circles. You've almost certainly seen this concept in an outward facing manner, meaning if you give at or above the thousand dollar level, you'll get in the mail, you know, this special thing and you'll get uh, two update letters from us and you'll be on our newsletter list. Um, that's great. You can also do an inward facing version of that where it's, it's not part of your pitch to donors. It's just a way that you sort of organize your folks. And so you can internally say, okay, for anybody who's at or above that $10,000 level, we wanna make sure that they're getting three personal outreaches from the executive director each year. They don't have to know that, but you know that, right? So that's a, a good way also to um, not set an expectation that you then later fail to meet. Okay, we had some questions in the pre-survey about handoffs, relationship handoffs, um, two in particular. One, what about an ongoing donor for the organization that you yourself don't have a relationship with? So they've given to the organization, but you're new in your role as development um, and you've never met them, they don't know you. Um, or maybe you've had total leadership team turnover and so they've got a relationship with the entity, um, but they don't really know anybody. This is tough. Um, 
So a couple pieces of advice. First, do everything you can to get a warm introduction from somebody. So if it's a past board member, if maybe it's that, that departed development director, um, if, if you can call in that favor to say, hey, would you mind just like, even if it's an email or join me at lunch, I'll, I'll buy your lunch if you'll, you'll join us and just kind of make this handoff, that's going to grease the wheels a lot. If you can't get that, um, then, then just go for it. Get a hold of them, probably by phone. Start by thanking them for their past support. Say, you know, introduce yourself, share that you're, you know, new on the job. You've been looking at the, the organization's donor records and you, you notice that they've been a really faithful donor and you're just really excited because you joined this team because you're really passionate about what this school is doing and you can tell they are too. Um, and if there's been a, a total drop off in communication with this donor, own that, recognize it, you know, read the room there. But um, if, if it's appropriate, apologize for the fact that they haven't heard from you for a while. And um, if that's the case, especially if they bring it up, if they're like, oh yeah, I was starting to wonder what was going on over there. Um, you may want to reset a new expectation. Like, yeah, you know, we, we dropped the ball on that. I'm really sorry. We've got a great plan to make sure that we're reporting out on a regular basis. Here's what you can expect from us going forward. What is essential though is if you are going to make that explicit, you have to keep those promises because otherwise it's gonna do some damage. Um, and then if you, if you have the opportunity, Try to, try to get more of a dialogue going to start to, to get that relationship magic. So you can ask questions like, how did you first hear about us? Or what, what made you give to us in the first place? Um, or, you know, we've got this brand new thing that I'm really excited about and I wanted to make sure you knew about it. Um, you can also just ask if they've got any questions about what's going on in the organization. That's, that's an evergreen one. Okay, so communicating with donors. Uh, you've got that relationship. You've been cultivating it. Um, a big important part of that work is communicating with donors on a regular basis. So we're going to get a lot more, we're going to hear a lot more from Mr. Tom Ahern and his 20 questions in this section. Um, so uh, oh, it looks like I um, have this slide uh, uh, after that last um, uh, placeholder slide and, and not before it. So one more on relationship. Uh, another question you had from about transitioning relationships is uh, when you've got relationships concentrated with one top level leader, maybe your ED or your board chair, how do you start transitioning those to someone else? Also tough, especially if that person feels like they've been getting special access to the top boss or someone who's really important, and now they feel like they're being handed off to some no-name underling. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's difficult. And so again, starting with a warm handoff uh, in person, if possible, is really powerful, um, or you know, now on a video chat. And if you think it's appropriate, and if you've agreed ahead of time with your boss, um, I'd, I'd say consider explaining why this shift is occurring and help them understand that it's part of fulfilling the mission and using their gift wisely. And so instead of this being like, so-and-so used to have time for you and now they're too busy, um, it, it's, it's more about as we continue to grow, more of our executive director's time is being demanded by our programs. And the we've decided um, that in order to make sure that she or he can concentrate as much effort as is necessary to achieve our mission, um, we need to take some things off of their plate. And one of those things is, is some of our relationships with our donors. Um, and so you can, you know, again, you got to read it. You got to read the situation. If you can tell that their relationship with your boss is what's really important to them, make sure that you are explaining how that will be maintained. Um, if you think it's uh, that they want to make sure that they're going to continue to get invitations to events or something like that, you can give them reassurances there. But um, the, the bottom line here is this is essential. You're going to have to do it. It isn't easy. Some people will have their feelings hurt. A lot of people will get over it. Um, just do it in a thoughtful and empathic way and try to meet them where they're at and meet their concerns as best you can. Okay, so now shifting into communication. Uh, another com uh, question from uh, Mr. Ahern here. Uh, he says there are two things that charities are lousy at, by and large. Um, and if you can be good at them, you can stand out and, and you'll stand a much better chance at renewing and keeping your donors. And that's thanking people promptly and reporting on what you've done with their gifts. Sounds basic. A lot of us do that like clockwork, but many charities just don't. It falls through the cracks. Okay. So how quickly should you thank a donor? Uh, let's see what we said with this one. Okay, most of us got this one exactly right. Uh, we said within 48 hours, some of us said within a week. Uh, I got to be honest, this is one that for me, 
I used to think the prompt thank you was not that big of a deal. Um, I thought, you know, as long as it's within a week, maybe even two weeks, you're fine. Um, this was when I was uh, responsible for processing all of the donations and making all of the receipts and thank yous and the grant proposals and all of that. And so uh, acknowledgements were lower on my list because they were the, the, um, the really rote, systematized, kind of just like routine stuff that uh, just is, never feels very desirable. Um, and so it's easy to say, oh, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow, or I'll wait till I've got a big stack of them and then I'll do them all at once. Here's the thing. The research shows us that if you thank a first time donor within 48 hours, they are four times as likely to give again. So that means whatever you need to do to, whatever you need to spend in terms of your time or even money, if, if, if this means you need to hire a person who comes in once a week and just does, uh, does acknowledgements, this means that the ROI there is 400%. That is bananas. So the bottom line here is whatever it takes to turn that uh, thank you out in 48 hours or less is worth its weight in gold, basically, literally. Um, and one of you just messaged to say that you found that this is very true in your practice too. Um, you can also further juice this with a thank you call. Um, again, this doesn't need to be from your boss. It can be from you, but a thank you call uh, boosts retention of first-year donors by 30%. Remember, we learned earlier in our presentation that first-year donors are very likely never to give again. And so if you can increase their retention with just one action, um, that phone call, or two actions, the prompt thank you note and the phone call, you are really, really stepping up your game. So Mr. Ahern again says, really, donor communications comes down to three things. Number one. You ask for my help, meaning you, the charity, asks for my, the donor's help. You thank me for my help, and you tell me what you did with that stuff. Okay, that's it. And if you can do that, you've got successful donor communications in the can. Your communications should be thoughtful, and that means, as part of good customer service, as part of being thoughtful and empathic, employing what's called user-centered design. Um, this means that you are thinking through who it is that is on the receiving end of everything that you put out. For example, your annual report, your newsletters, your uh, appeal. Um, your appeal letter is not for your board chair. It's not for your executive director. It's for your donors. And so if you know that your donors are all 70 plus, you should think very seriously about using a larger font size for your letter. Okay, that's something that a lot of us don't do. Um, I know that's something that we don't do. Um, it's something that a lot of folks are going to push back on because it means you can fit less on a page. Um, but the, uh, the, the Professional Association for Graphic Designers suggests for folks who are 70 plus using 14 point font um, to make it easier to read. If one of your donors gets your letter and it's at 10 point font because you wanted to squeeze a little bit more on that page and they just physically can't read it, what do you think is going to happen with that? Not anything good. Okay, how much is too much? Um, first, my, my big thought on this is it's all about the expectations that you set. So if right now you only send out one newsletter a year and one appeal a year, and all of a sudden, without warning, you switch to sending out four appeals a year, that's going to be jarring for your donors and they're gonna feel a way about it, right? Likewise, if you're somebody who sends out monthly email newsletters like clockwork, and then suddenly you downshift to two a year, they're going to notice that too, and they're going to feel a way about it. So part of this is continuing whatever you've got and making any changes either gradually or with a lot of communication about the communication. And so it's okay to say to your donors, we're going to start talking to you more and here's why and here's what you can expect. You can like be like meta communicative about that. If you set expectations, try to meet your expectations because again, people notice that and that feeling of disappointment is going to attach to their perception of your brand. Um, one thing that you can do is send them a short survey to gauge their communications preferences. Some organizations send this survey with everything that they send, everything. There's this short survey that people can choose to return or a QR code to a survey. Um, this allows people to customize exactly what they want to get from you and when. Um, a couple of interesting things on this uh, also. Another question from Mr. Ahern. Um, so how often can you make an ask before you turn off donors? Um, let's see what we thought about this. 
we said three times a year was our, our bulk answer. It's actually way, way, way more than that. This one blew my mind. Um, a couple of thoughts here. Donors will complain verbally about over solicitation or you sending them too much stuff. The research shows it does not impact their giving. And actually there's a bit, some research that shows the opposite, which we'll get to on the next slide. Now you can ask 21 times a year before you start costing yourself donors as a result. That does not mean you should ask 21 times a year or that it's even beneficial. It's just, that's where you start losing people. Um, but, if you ask once a year and there's been an internal debate about should we go to two appeals a year, you don't have to worry about turning people off with that second appeal. Um, some of the pros interviewed with Mr. Ahern for his book said that eight is a good sweet spot. Four appeals, four newsletters or info pieces. That's pretty manageable even for a small team. Um, obviously, if you're wearing a bunch of hats, um, that might seem totally overwhelming. So, you know, that's, that's a best practice. It's something to work up to. It's a good goal. Most of us are not doing that. I know we are not doing that at all. Um, but the risk is if you under communicate, people will give to you. They will forget about you. Um, you won't cement that, that emotional relational experience with them and it will cost you as a result. So, like I said, there's some more details about this. Uh, this is a real world experiment um, that is included in the 20 questions book. So there was a charity that usually sends 12 appeals a year, once a month. Um, they took a pilot group of 500 people who gave at the $500 level and sent them a survey allowing them to choose how many, how many mailings they'd get each year. Um, so about a third of them replied and, and no one who replied wanted more than three mailings. Okay, so some people said zero, some people said one, some people said two. No one said that they wanted 12 or even six. Um, but at the end of the year, the ones who got all 12 gave 35% more than the people who opted into fewer uh, mailings. So I said before, people will complain to you about solicitations and about mailings. They will say, this is a waste of resources. The research shows that by and large, uh, people might think that they don't like getting all that mail, but the way that they behave shows that it's working, that it is actually prompting them to give more. What's the best medium? Okay, we asked a question about online giving. Uh, we guessed as a group, 75% of us thought that 10 to 25% of charitable giving is now online. It's actually quite a bit less than 10 still. Um, it is growing, but it's small. Uh, this is one of the many reasons why I think Giving Tuesday is a joke. Uh, because it just doesn't, it doesn't return anywhere near as much as what a lot of us put into it. Uh, I'll get back to the online thing in a second too, because there's some more details there. Uh, how about direct mail? Um, okay, almost all of us said no, direct mail is definitely not past its peak, and that is true. The research shows that this is far and away both the, the most used and best way to get new first-time donors and to get renewals from your donors. Phone calls are also good. The research shows people mostly ignore email. Email is, especially for appeal requests, you are best off using email as a complement and a supplement to your direct mail. One more reminder, one more physical touch. Okay, a little bit more on the, the, the medium and the online thing. Here's, here's the deal. Um, we said, a little less than 10% of US giving comes online. Well, a big chunk of those online gifts are actually the result of direct mail. So someone's getting the mail and then they're saying, oh, rather than get out my checkbook, I'm gonna take out my phone and snap this QR or I'm going to go to their website and donate. Um, so even when we do get online gifts, it's usually not coming from an online solicitation. So uh, yeah, great stat here. Three times as likely to give online in response to a direct mail appeal versus an email appeal. Okay, so you, my takeaway from this is definitely in your mailed appeal, give an easy way for people to give online, but don't expect that your email appeal is going to stand in for your direct mail appeal anytime soon. Um, but the multiple touch points is huge. So if you send an email and a direct mail piece, you've boosted your likelihood of uh, hearing back from folks by 20% and your retention rates go up too. So length, 
this has been a hotly debated thing around our office. Most of you said what I thought for the longest time, which is that one page is the best length. It's actually four pages is the best length. Uh, but here's the thing, four pages isn't a magic number. Um, just like one page isn't a magic number. What matters most is the magic of the writing. Um, so if your letter is just okay, if the person who writes your letters just frankly straight up isn't that good at it, if you know you're not that good at it, if you've not had the experience in the training, keep it short. You know, be brief, be polite, be straightforward, and be gone, as they say. Uh, but if you are really good, or whoever does this for your organization is really good, or if you are paying some outside professional who is an expert at writing letters, then by all means, let it go on. Um, there is so much more you can read about this. Um, and in this 20 questions book that I will send you, uh, it includes references to a bunch of other books you may want to read. There is a, a complete separate branch of art and science all about how to write really good fundraising appeal letters, including how you use bolding and indents and spacing and the size of the paper and everything. Okay, preferred grade level for uh, our appeal. Most of us got this one correct, sixth grade, okay? Um, we measure that with the, the scale called Flesh Kincaid, which is an iffy tool. Lots of us have left it behind in our work as educators. It's still useful for something quick hit like this. Uh, sometimes folks in your organization might say, but our, our donors all have, uh, you know, we know that 80% of our donors have graduate degrees. So we can't use sixth grade language or we're talking down to them. Um, it's not about talking down, it's about talking with clarity. Um, it's about having your fundraising copy be easy to read and conversational because the lower the grade level, the faster your brain can move through the ideas. Um, Mr. Aaron in his book goes a, a lot more in depth about why that's a good thing and even writes some paragraphs at different grade levels so that you can kind of get a sense of how, no, it, it doesn't feel like a child is talking to you. Um, how about this one? Are newsletters worth it? Uh, most of us got this one right. We said, no, news newsletters are great. Uh, newsletters are uh, comparable to appeals in terms of what they, they return for you, a little bit higher. So good idea to send them with a reply device. Uh, I'll have some more notes on there. We have this one twice for some reason, sorry about that. Uh, there are some rules. For newsletters. Um, there's something called the domain formula, which you can read much more about that gets into how to have your newsletters be as powerful as they can. Um, but here are the basics. No more than four pages, short articles that are written for skimming um, with really snappy headlines that facilitate that skimming. Here's a big one. The data show that if you send this thing in an envelope, it's going to have a much higher return than if you send it as a self-mailer. Um, self-mailer being where the thing itself is folded with a little like adhesive and then the label goes right on it and it's not inside anything. Um, those are less successful for whatever reason. Um, make sure you include a reply device, your, your return envelope, whatever it is. Um, your audience is just your donors when you're sending out a newsletter. Get very clear on who your donors are so you can write just for them and what they're interested in. Um, be very personal in how you write. Use the word you a ton. Um, remember, this is about making your donor feel like a hero um, because of what they've done by giving to your organization. And so the framing of these pieces is all about them. And again, the, the book has some concrete examples, like a before and after of an organization that did some A-B testing, same newsletter articles, but just different framing um, and, and way, way different results. Um, and then you're, you're focusing on reporting on your accomplishments, how much the, your donor has changed the world through their gifts. Um, so what goes in newsletters? Well, unfortunately, uh, pictures of sad kids raise more money than happy kids. Um, I'm not very happy to hear that, but there is a biological reason for why that is the case. Um, when we see people that our brains recognize as being our same species that are in a bad way, um, it evokes our, uh, our uh, part of our, our brainstem response, part of our flight, fight or flight that we want to help them. Um, there's a, a way that you can use this um, so that you're not just always sending bad, sad pictures. Um, appeals use negative or more neutral imagery. Newsletters use more positive imagery to convey what the donation has accomplished. Now, this is my addition um, to Mr. Ahern's uh, stuff, is you, you need to use your discretion and your personal and organizational ethics to make sure that you're not being exploitative 
of the people whose photos you are using. Um, so, you know, if you've got, I mean, first of all, just taking a picture of a kid who's having a bad day um, and using it as an illustration of like, oh, our students are, are such sad people with sad lives, like that is extremely problematic and you should not ever do it. Um, I think sharing a photo uh, of a kid who's just sort of like straight faced in class um, and talk about like the, the need for your school to be able to, to serve all of Milwaukee's children. There are ways to do it like that where you aren't um, engaging in what is sometimes called poverty porn, where you are you know, pimping out the people you serve to raise money from you know, wealthy people. Um, so you may learn about this and go, okay, cool. Sad kids raise more money. I'm never gonna be comfortable with this. I'm never gonna use this. This is just like below my ethical standard good for you, like truly. Um, I, I mean that in all honesty. Um, I don't think you should ever engage in any sort of practice or behavior, whatever the, the mean, like the ends doesn't justify the means is what I'm trying to say. Um, so know this, think about how it squares or doesn't square with your personal and organizational ethics and make your choices accordingly. Okay, do you include a bunch of information to educate your donors or do you not? Uh, I know this is one that most of our bosses and apparently all of us according to our quiz would think is true, but it's actually false. Um, you can risk coming across as condescending, teachy, boring, um, and you want to avoid that. Uh, the other thing is, is we care a lot about the details of our programs. We care about the specific names of our programs. We care about like um, all of the, the research that came into creating that program and behind it and exactly who it's targeted at. Um, our donors care about one thing. They care about fixing the problem that they are invested in. And all they want to know is that you have a program and the program works. All of the other stuff is a lot less important. So avoid that fine grained specific. Remember, they're, they're not giving to you. They're not giving to your program. They're giving through you in your program to make an impact. That's what they care about. So uh, what do we write? Stats or stories? Um, again, if you came to our marketing uh, training, you learned a little bit about this. Um, we were about uh, half and half on this. Um, some of us said stories. Some of us said depends on the audience. The, the hard answer is depends on the audience, but uh, stories is really the, the right answer because it's a small exception. If your audience uh, is an institution, so you're writing a government grant or a large foundation that does a bunch of research, um, then you should be engaging in stats. But remember, um, your uh, audience is making emotional decisions, and so you need to appeal to them on an emotional basis. Uh, giving your money to a charity to get nothing in return is a very irrational decision, just concretely. Um, and so it, it's, it's not a rational decision. It's an emotional decision. And so um, communicating to people on that basis is what's proven effective. And there's some biology behind this too that you need to be careful that you're not misusing because um, you can commit evil with this. But when you use narrative to communicate with people, it actually releases the um, neurotransmitter oxytocin uh, and that facilitates all kinds of good stuff. It's a feel good hormone, but it also facilitates cooperation and people's willingness to help others. So by telling people stories about your work, you are, you are, um, actually putting their brain into a state where they are going to feel more willing to make donations and to engage with you. Um, one of you said in the chat that it, it feels almost counterintuitive. Um, if the donors want to see impact, which we said on the last uh, stage st uh, slide, why wouldn't we focus on stats? Because that's the impact. Well, here's, here's what I would answer to that is stats and stories both show impact. It's just stats show it in a very analytical, rational way where stories tell about the impact. And again, there, there are some really good examples of this in the book. Okay, also every story needs a hero. This is another one we talked a lot about at the marketing training. Um, who is the hero in our fundraising? Most of us said it's the people who are being helped. That's actually the wrong answer. Um, it's the donor, which again, might make you feel a little uncomfortable, but uh, what we are selling when people buy into our organization by making a donation. There's an exchange of capital there, right? So they are buying something from us. What are they buying? Well, they're buying good feelings is, is what it is in, in, a, in a short way. Even if that's not their conscious 
orientation. That's not what they mean to be doing. Um, the research tells us that that's what's happening. They're purchasing the, the warm feelings of having done a good thing. They're, they're purchasing the ability to tell themselves a positive story about themselves and who they are and, and how they engage with the world. They're purchasing belonging. They're purchasing the ability to say to their friends, oh yeah, I give to that too. Maybe it's a, a marker of of their own wealth and achievement. And so it's, it sounds and feels very cynical and very bad, but to a point, philanthropy is transactional. And so we can, knowing that, we can communicate about our work in a way that um, helps match what our donors are expecting to get from us. Um, so again, instead of talking about how great we are as an organization, we can talk about how they have been able to accomplish great things through their gift to us. Now, the focus can still be on the kids, right? But instead of saying, um, our school moved you know, so-and-so ahead by X grade levels, it's your gift allowed so-and-so to grow this amount over this period of time. Okay, some of you said, but okay, you've tried all this stuff. What about when none of it works? How do you know when it's time to just like say, bye-bye? Um, first, there's a rule you've probably heard about fundraising that um, there are two answers to an ask. One is yes, and one is not right now. Um, you'll notice that there's not a no listed there. And that's because no is never no forever in fundraising. Um, you're gonna hear a camera snap. Uh, right now, I'm just taking a photo of our participant list for attendance purposes. Um, so when somebody says to you no to your ask, what they're really saying is no for now, right? Um, come back and ask another time. But uh, that's nice to say. Um, it's sort of true. But at the same time, if someone says no to you for 10 years and you just keep asking, then you're, you're kind of wasting your time in theirs and probably risking making them upset. So sometimes you have to do what uh, my friend and colleague, Andrea Homan, who joins us on some of our trainings, um, calls bless and release. I think she got that from a, a former colleague of hers where you're basically saying, no hard feelings. It's clear you don't want to give to us. We're no longer going to chase after you. We're going to focus our, our attention and resources elsewhere. Um, so I would encourage you to come up with a definition for when you call it quits. Um, how many times have you tried? How many years has this person been getting your appeal and not responding? How many times have you, um, have they attended an event but have never made a gift and figure out like this is when we drop people off. And you don't need to feel bad about that because for every person you take off your list, it's, a, it's more um, time and, and resources that you can put on the people who are still on your list or maybe you can replace them on your list with someone else who's a, a stronger prospect. All right, last chunk. What about now? We're in this crazy time. Uh, a lot of the rules about life in general and about fundraising feel like they no longer apply. Uh, is that true? And how do we respond? Um, before I jump into this part, there was a webinar yesterday from um, Northwestern's Kellogg School um, that, that answered this specific question. Um, I joined it yesterday and have included a few of the thoughts from that in um, these next couple of slides. However, they are going to be posting the full recording of the webinar and the slide deck on their website. Um, I checked last night and it wasn't posted yet, but when it is, I'm gonna send that out to this group and post it on our group Facebook um, so that you all can check that out if you want, because it gets uh, much more in depth um, and shows how uh, large charities across the country are responding to this. So my first thought here is that the situation has changed, but your overall orientation to this work is still the same. It still goes back to your SMART goals. It still goes back to those SMART goals, which are rooted in your organization's strategic plan. So if your organization's strategy has changed, then that means your fundraising goals probably need to change also. And then flowing down from there, the tactics you use to achieve those goals probably need to change as well. So if big things about your organization have changed that have made big shifts in its budget. Um, maybe a bunch of new costs have surfaced or costs that are outside of what your current funding streams can be used for. Um, or maybe you have created a whole new programmatic area in response to COVID-19 um, that you now need to fundraise for. Those would be big org level strategies that are changing that require you to shift your fundraising strategy accordingly. Um, but maybe your organization strategy is still largely intact, depending on how it was written. So if your work before was about um, 
about providing great instruction to your students and ensuring you've got the resources to do that, that really hasn't changed. The tactics that will be used to achieve both of those goals will change quite a bit, um, but the goals haven't changed. And that's good news for you because that means that your goals might also be relatively intact. Maybe the numbers shift a little bit, maybe the, the amount you're trying to raise goes up or down, um, but the, the big picture probably stays the same, um, which I think I, I find kind of comforting because um, you might think that you've got to toss it totally out the window and blank page this thing. You, you probably don't. Um, probably a lot of what you already planned is adaptable. Um, some of it might be even just unchanged. So don't, don't go ahead and um, rush to toss stuff out that might still be your, your best goal and your best strategy. So don't just completely stop. Um, and I mean, now we're in week seven, I think it is. So even if you did jam on the brakes, you've probably at least started thinking about uh, taking your foot off the brake pedal. Um, some of us might be thinking, well, all these people are losing their jobs. We can't ask for money now. That's tone deaf. Um, or people are just getting flooded with email. They don't want to hear from us. Um, I, I hear you. Um, definitely keep those things in mind as you approach this strategy with empathy and, and with thought. Um, but the core principles of fundraising are the same. And the presenter for Kellogg said, that, said exactly this yesterday. Um, she said, like, th these core essential principles of fundraising are still the same. People give to people, not organizations. And they give because they are asked. And so those two things hold true, which means that you still need to connect people with what you're doing and help them feel that personal relational connection with your organization and with your students. And you still need to ask for money because they're not going to just give uh, randomly for the most part. Um, keep communicating. Uh, yes, we've all gotten deluges of email um, from every organization under the sun, including a bunch of random brands that for some reason want us to know that we're still allowed to buy their stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, you probably don't need to send a weekly email update um, for that reason, but do keep communicating and consider uh, going to the phone now more than ever. Uh, people are home more. We know statistically that people are answering more of their calls. Um, the most recent Marquette Law Poll, uh, sh they had a, a response rate that was like five times their normal completion rate. Um, which is wild, like that it was through the roof for pollsters. Like I think they said they normally expect two to 3% of people to answer the phone and stay on the phone to complete the survey. And they had about 10% of people uh, who stayed on the phone and completed the survey. And a lot of those people wanted to keep talking to the poll person after the survey had ended. Um, so people wanna talk to you. They wanna talk to people because they're feeling pretty isolated right now. And so um, you're giving them something that they want and need by, by offering an opportunity to have a personal connection with you or, or someone else on your team and with your mission. Um, when you make a phone call also, you can totally individualize and customize your um, information and reach out to them. So versus an email blast where everybody's getting the same thing, you can modulate in real time. Um, maybe you call them up and they've had a loved one pass away from COVID-19. Um, and you can attend to that. You can express empathy. Um, you can be there for them and, and be a genuine, real human being in a way that your bulk email can't do. Um, empathy is the key here. Um, this is another emphasis, uh, emphasis that our presenter yesterday at Kellogg uh, said that, that being thoughtful about how you're connecting with donors, asking them how they are doing, thanking them for their past support, um, and providing a bit of an update saying, you know, so much is changing right now, including in the lives of our students in our school. We also understand the, that a lot of our donors, um, that their ability to give in support of what we're doing has changed. Um, some people have asked us how they can help during this time. And so here's, here's what we've been telling them. Um, that's a good way to sort of segue into like, what what could become an ask or what is sort of a soft ask without being like hi i'm calling to ask you for money um but a lot of donors do understand there's significant need and they want a way to help out they, they want a way to feel like they can give back and, and be um, making the overall situation better and so if you can offer that to them that is a big plus okay events this has been a huge question every time that that we've gotten folks together for our advancement working group there have been a ton of questions about events should we keep it, cancel it, postpone it, switch it to virtual. Um, I would say first, like I said, way at the beginning of our time today, um, this is a really good time to take a step back and rethink 
everything about your event, including whether you should keep doing it. Some of us have inherited events, right? Your organization always does the blank thing, the, the golf outing, the, the annual dinner, whatever. And so uh, you, it's been going on for 10 years. You've been on the job for two. You know, who be, it, who, who be you to say, we're not gonna do that thing anymore, it doesn't make sense. Now might be your chance because a lot of those events kind of grow long in the teeth way past their, when they should be canceled. Um, because remember, this is all about your goals. So if that event is the best way for you to achieve your goals, period, keep doing it. If it's not, then take a really critical look at it, especially right now, okay? Um, because it might make sense during a normal year. It might not make sense during this year. Um, I mentioned earlier a tactic where you can engage board members to do like a cocktail hour with people who are close to them. The, the virtual version of that, which the presenter yesterday shared about, is what she referred to as parlor conversation. So this would be, you know, a Zoom call, of course, or, or using some similar platform where a key board member plays host. They're inviting people from their social circles, their work circles to come discuss, have a, have a conversation about education, um, and then you know, your, your host can give some remarks, uh, your executive director or some other key staff member can also give some remarks that share an update about your school and how you're responding to this. It's a way for people to engage in a, in a way that's kind of um, that same blend of social, but also philanthropic and civically engaged that, that makes those cocktail hours normally a draw. Uh, some of you asked me, do you think that virtual events are going to basically become oversaturated. Our donor's gonna get sick of these. Um, the, the straight up answer is there's no way to know. We've never been in a situation like this before. Virtual events have basically not existed prior to this, not, not at scale. Um, and so there isn't an answer to that. Um, we've also never been in a time where people are basically homebound. And so I can envision, envision a, a scenario where people are super, super sick of being on Zoom all day. Um, and would never want to go to some sort of virtual event. Um, I could also envision the same, um, the same forces that cause people to respond more actively to political polls and stay on the phone to make them really eager to participate in a virtual event. Um, but as far as oversaturation, um, I've, I've heard from plenty of donors that they felt in-person events were oversaturated uh, in, in the recent years. And so I can't imagine that they wouldn't feel the same way about virtual events at some point. Um, and so I, I would just encourage you again to be thoughtful about um, what is the most effective way to achieve your goal. Uh, the one big upside with virtual events is the cost is extremely low. Um, you're not investing a bunch of money and then hoping that you will raise enough to offset that and all of the staff time. Um, not that it's free, or frictionless or easy or no time at all to put together a virtual event. But when compared with what it would take to reserve a space and pick out a menu and decorate and do the invitations and all that kind of stuff, um, it's definitely a lower lift. Um, but the flip side of that is it's probably going to result in a lot of other people choosing to do it because it's easier. So that is the end of our content. Um, you probably noticed that we did not get through all 20 of Tom Ahern's questions. That's by design. I picked the, the ones that were the strongest fit with today's content, um, but I wanted to give you the full quiz on the front end. Um, so uh, this is a little bit of a reading rainbow moment because if you want to um, hear the rest of the story and get the answers to the rest of those questions that you were quizzed on at the front end, uh, I strongly, strongly, strongly suggest checking out Mr. Ahern's book, which I will send a link to after we are done today. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. You can drop questions in the chat or you can just unmute and speak up. Uh, we've got about 19 minutes left. Um, we'll, we'll wrap when we're kind of come to our natural end here, but uh, I did wanna make sure that we're reserving time for your thoughts or your questions. Hi, this is Patrick Landry from Notre Dame School of Milwaukee. Uh, I just wanted to comment that we are doing a virtual event on June 17th. Uh, we traditionally have our salsa sampler. It was actually supposed to be May 5th. And um, we originally were going to move it to September for an in-person event, but think that there's just too many unknowns even with that. And so I think I just offer that 
we're learning a lot through this process in terms of uh, how to create content and places in town that will help you with a studio and I'm happy to share kind of our hits and misses as we go through this process if there are other schools that are interested in virtual events over the summer or the fall. Thank you, Patrick. That would be great. I saw the invite go out uh, was that earlier this week or last week. Um, and I also noticed that you adapted this event to specifically be focusing on fundraising for your summer school program, which of course now takes on um, a totally new importance. Um, so that would be another example of kind of rethinking your, your strategy to align with the adjusted goals of your organization. Additional thoughts and questions. Israel, I, I had an email start about other people might be interested. If you, if we're in a small organization that doesn't have really anything organized around this yet, you know, everything's been kind of organic. Do you have some sort of like starter pack entry level, small scale, you know, like even, even donor databases and things, we do have constant contact. But other than that, like, you know, like if you were to start small and say, here's a entry level getting into it, these are key things that I think would help you stay organized as far as the, I loved all your charts and everything in the beginning. And, I, and I'm trying to think like, what would be the least overwhelming to get started? That's a great question. I think starting with something like constant contact is a, a good toehold because it's a free or low cost resource compared to some of the, the more purpose built uh, fundraising CRMs that can be costly. Um, that said, some of those are also pretty affordable. So if you're getting to the point where you feel like you're outgrowing constant contact, if you're hitting up against its limitations, it, it could be worth looking at um, some of those lower cost CRMs. Um, as we, as an organization, use Salesforce, which I would um, probably advise against if you're just starting off because it's pretty complicated and requires some front-end investment to have somebody build out your configuration to be useful. It's not really useful out of the box. Um, the upside is that Salesforce itself is completely free, um, which is awesome, but you have to pay several thousand dollars to have somebody make it into something that's actually useful to you. Um, so I think constant contact is a great place to start. You can, I think MailChimp and constant contact both have built a lot of CRM functionality into um, their products. You can do more things tracking wise than you used to be able to do. Um, so I would say to, to move, you know, if you're looking for one thing to do to level up, um, I would say starting with a gift chart, is probably the, the best place because that's not only a way to get strategic about how you're um, approaching your fundraising, it's also something that you can use to invest team members and your board in. Um, it's, it's kind of overwhelming and unclear to just say, hey board, this year we have to raise $1.2 million or whatever it is, like, can you help us? Um, you know, that's, that's there's not, um, it's too big and too uh, general. There's not, there's not like handholds. Whereas when you show someone a gift chart and say, we're looking for one $250,000 gift this year. And so we know that, that we should have four prospects that, that we think could, could give us that $250,000. Um, now you've got like some great handholds where a board committee or, or a board can engage in a brainstorm about like, who do we think could give us 250? Um, and you know, who do you know, who do, who do you know? And then when you get that one 250 K gift, that is a huge cause for celebration. Um, you might normally think like, Oh my, my goodness, like a quarter million dollars, like what a great success, but it's different when you're saying our plan was to just get one of those and we got it. Like that's an enormous accomplishment versus we raised $250,000 out of our $1.2 million goal. So like cool it's a big chunk but we still have so much further to go so i think anytime that you can shrink the change to to borrow um some language from the book switch um and and you know make really clear like step by step bite-sized ways that people can help accomplish the goal um just in terms of organizational psychology that that's a much better way to move people toward doing that. So I, I would say that's going to give you a lot of bang for your buck. It's also one of the least complex things to do. So like the weighted pipeline, you got to build a spreadsheet with some formulas. It doesn't have to be 
anything crazy, but it's just, it's a little more. Whereas the gift chart is, um, is something that you can do without any specialized tools, without a lot of background knowledge, without even really a lot of time. Um, otherwise we will close out here. Um, if there are any specific resources that you would like, please note them in the chat. I'm gonna go back through this and anything concrete that I talked about, I'll send in a follow-up email um, in, in, along with a link to the 20 questions book, um, which again um, is the, the, best, um, the best sort of informational resource on fundraising that I have ever come across in terms of like how much great stuff is concentrated in such a small number of pages. So please do check that out. Uh, you can get a hold of me at the contact information that's now on the screen. Please let me know anytime that you could use some feedback on something. If you're trying to solve a problem and you want an external set of ears or eyes, um, really any reason at all, if there's something that I can do to help move your work forward, please let me know. Otherwise, thank you again for joining us. 